um, dois. Só um, dois.
Bom dia a todos e a todas. Eu assumo que a maior parte são estudantes aqui do doutoramento de Sociologia do Direito, certamente todos. Eu gostava, antes da gente começar, porque são poucos, da gente se apresentar, está bom? O meu nome é Boa Ventura, de Sousa Santos, eu vou começar. Nesta sala vocês já viram que é por causa da questão das transmissões online que temos que fazer, porque não faz sentido estarmos aqui nesta sala com tão pouca gente uh, para o nosso debate que eu gostaria de ter convosco. Mas enfim, é o tempo em que a gente está e não há solução. De modo que vamos... Eu reparo que os vossos óculos já estão habituados às, às máscaras. Eu, como estou a viver no campo, onde nunca uso máscara, os meus olhos, os meus óculos estão desacostumados e ficam cheios de umidade. Vamos lá. Ok. Good morning, everyone. This is a class for the PhD program and sociology of law. And of course, open to other students because it's considered a masterclass, which in our school means that it's an open class. 
And I am glad to welcome you here. It's my first class, this uh, academic year. And um, I'll be teaching in this uh, program uh, another time next Saturday. And then, uh, and then in the second semester, I will also be teaching master classes, but uh, for the other programs starting March. Um, and this I'm very glad to be here because it's the first time that we are offering this uh, PhD program. In fact, we started, uh, as you know, we have been very strong in the sociology of law uh, almost from the very beginning, uh, and particularly because of my studies in the United States and then in Brazil, Portugal, and so on. And um, as far as PhD programs are concerned, we started, in fact, with uh, a program together with uh, the law faculty here in Quimbra. Uh, it so happens that it, it went well, very well for a while because it was uh, co-organized by the two schools in which two good friends uh, from uh, who had been both uh, students at the same time uh, at the law school here because before sociology I was in law here during the dictatorship in Portugal. Uh, Professor Joaquin Gomes Canutillo, a great constitutionalist from the law school, and myself. And so we co-organized this program uh, and it went very well for a while. Uh, then he retired and the law school, because it's one of the most conservative law schools in the world, I think, uh, not just in Portugal, but everywhere, I would say, from I consider, in which we have professors, creationist professors leading the school and things like that, which I think is quite abnormal today, but you know, um, that's what it is. It became almost impossible for us to continue to work together with them because this, our students were uh, confronted very often with conflicts, uh, very strict conflicts. Uh, while for instance here at SES, we uh, avoid everything that we uh, smell uh, sexism or racism uh, that was not the case on the other side so ooh, we had to end up that program there are some students still uh, preparing the, their phd programs there and i'm very we are very glad the ones that are doing with us it was a very good program because the students would have a joint program at the beginning of the first year and then they would select either to do in sociology of law or in law and if we, they were in, uh, in sociology of law, they would be doing with us. Uh, now, we have a new, very exciting program because it's fully organized by ourselves at SES and School of Economics. It's on sociology of law and the state. Um, and this is the first year that we are offering it. And we are very uh, happy to have you here and very hopeful that this uh, PhD program uh, will be uh, success like the others. Well, we have seen, I've seen here students from the, the other programs in which I also been, been teaching and uh, they are also very successful here at, uh, at SES, the, the PhD on human rights and uh, the PhD on post-colonialism and global citizenship. Uh, so I, I'm very glad that we have uh, students and I'm glad also to have students from uh, international relations and master students and you know first degree students my classes have always been open to all of you so uh because of the program i have to teach in english i will be teaching in portuguese uh, in the second semester in this uh, uh for this program i'll be teaching in english and for me it's quite frankly it's basically the same thing because for the 35 years past uh, i was teaching also in the united states and therefore it's no problem for me. I hope there is no problem for you uh, because that's the program that we are offering. Right? Okay, the, pro the, the program for these two classes are the following. Um, I'm trying to, uh, in the first class, I'm going to talk about a great tradition of the sociology of law, which we have been calling uh, legal reformism. That is to say, the extent to which law can be used to bring about a progressive social change. Uh, and my first class will be basically on the lineages of this uh, exciting program. And the second class will be on the collapse of this paradigm of legal reformism. I think that we are witnessing in the world 
the collapse of this model of legal reformism. And therefore, I'm offering you in the second class next Saturday a theory for the post uh, legal reformism period in which we are, which uh, does not uh, uh, allow us to predict a very exciting future, but that's the one we have. And uh, as a social scientists, we have to theorize about uh, what we have now. So these are the, the two classes. In this class, I will start by analyzing the lineages of legal reformism, the extent to which it was basically an European history, uh, an European story, I would say, but um, probably not anymore. Um, and I'll start by that. And then I'll refer to you my journey on this, because I've been very, a uh, very active participant in this movement of the sociology of law. And, uh, and I've, I've been uh, writing ex uh, you know, extensively about that. You have uh, uh, most of my work in the sociology of law is here in this uh, Toward the New Legal Common Sense, the, the third edition just came out uh, by Cambridge. And uh, uh, in Portuguese, you have the three volumes uh, in which it's a kind of a condensation of most of the work I've done. Uh, the first book is called uh, The Law of the Oppressed, Direito dos Oprimidos. It was my PhD uh, work uh, in the favelas of Jacarezinho in Rio. Then the second one is uh, Justiça Popular em Cabo Verde, Popular Justice in Cape Verde, which was my work on the post-independence period of popular justice in Cape Verde Islands. And then uh, the last one is uh, Bifurcação, as Bifurcações do Ordem, uh, in which I'm trying to account for the crisis of the, all this paradigm of bringing about progressive social change through law. These uh, three volumes in Portuguese are available in Brazil now in a new edition by uh, a publishing house called Lumen Juris uh, from Rio de Janeiro. And the next year probably will come about the follow-up of this book. It's a new book that I'm uh, finishing up now for Cambridge. It's called The Pluriverse of Law. Uh, and eventually it will be translated into Portuguese and published in Portuguese. So let's start by this, because it's a long journey. So it's, uh, we are talking about almost 50 years of work on the sociology of law. So the, first of all, I think that what, what is legal reformism? I, I mean, it's this idea that you can bring about peaceful and piecemeal social change through law, gradual social transformation, progressive in the sense that it's becoming more inclusive, uh, leading to a more inclusive society, a more just society, but without the convulsions, the interruptions, the violence that is usually associated with revolution. So you can see here that there is this binary law on one side and revolution on the other side. Well, it's a very old type of my binary. We can say that everything started in the 12th century where, where the, the, the reception of Roman law. Uh, the reception of law, Roman law in Europe is the beginning of the involvement of law in the tasks of social transformation. Uh, it was the beginning of uh, emerging bourgeoisie in Europe, uh, commercial bourgeoisie, particularly the Italian one. And the reception of Roman law is twice, is, uh, an, uh, an attempt uh, to bring about a legal regulation of economic relations that would facilitate the development of, uh, of the emerging bourgeoisie. Well, this is a long story. Of course, I'm going to tell you that the, the first revolution, modern revolution, that in fact, it is not in which we see the binary uh, law and revolution, but they are not opposed. Uh, is the French Revolution. The French Revolution is a revolution that, in fact, there is no antagonism between law and, uh, and, and revolution because they didn't believe that what existed before was something called law, as an autonomous field of political action. So the French Revolution is really trying to create a new law 
by revolutionary means. And therefore, there is a, this a, a coordination between a, a revolution through which a new law will come about. And there will be a new law that will produce this progressive uh, social change, right? Well, then 1848, we have the revolutions in Europe and we, where we can see already very uh, obvious tension between the revolutionary uh, protests and the revolutionary ideas of social transformation and those that were in favor of a more piecemeal and peaceful social transformation through law. And uh, this uh, second paradigm is going to have uh, a new life and a very exciting life after the, second, the First World War, 1918, in the Weimar Republic of Germany. Germany was uh, one of the most developed countries in Europe before the war, before the First World War, 1914. And during that period, as you know, uh, it closed the Russian Revolution. And all of a sudden, uh, the Russian Revolution brings a new life to the revolutionary ideas of the French Revolution. And uh, putting aside all the legal uh, apparatuses of the Tsarist uh, uh, imperial Russia. And uh, the tension between law and revolution is very clear. The way in which the Soviets are going to occupy courts and uh, the legislative up after 1918 and so on. So there is a really a tension. And from then on, the working class movement, the movement that was really the only movement then that was trying to bring about uh, social change, progressive social change, this working class that sometimes were parties, sometimes were trade unions, emerging trade unions, all this um, were split. And were split uh, in uh, really two alternatives uh, for social transformation, the revolutionary and the legal one. And uh, these two paradigms are going to confront each other throughout the 20th century in different moments, as we'll see. So this confrontation between the revolutionary uh, way of transforming society, which uh, Soviet Union at the time is showing to the world that it is possible and uh, exciting, so to say. And in Germany, we are going to have, at the end of the First World War, they were defeated. And uh, a new republic, the end of the, the Prussian Empire uh, ends. And we have the Weimar. Weimar was the city, the capital city. And that's why it is called the Weimar Republic. And then this Weimar Republic from 1918 to 1921, we are going to have something that most people don't acknowledge having existed, but existed. It was the German Revolution. Uh, in fact, following the paths of the Russian Revolution, uh, because it was the idea that we could reproduce revolution in a developed country because uh, Russia was not a developed country, it was an underdeveloped country. And Lenin, one of the leaders of the Russian revolution had said very often that the Russian revolution <coughs> would succeed only on the condition that would happen in a developed country. Therefore, in Russia, in, in, in Germany, all of them were focusing on Germany. Uh, so we are going to have a debate and not just a debate, a political struggle between people that all of them claim to be socialists. But some thought that to bring about socialism in Germany could not be through the revolutionary way. And others thought it would be just revolution, probably a different revolution from the Russian one because it was a different society. And the people really entered a civil war, basically a civil war. Uh, and um, we all know the names of the revolutionary period of those, uh, the, that period, the, the most important leaders of the Marxist movement, uh, writing exciting things about, uh, particularly Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg, even though she was Polish, she was really one of the leading figures of the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, which was the Socialist Party in, in, uh, in Germany, pleading for a revolutionary solution to the end of capitalism. 
and uh, but she was assassinated in, in 1921 and Knesset. so the civil war came to an end only in 1921 and all the revolutionary uh, option was defeated so we started then with the the other uh, paradigm of social transformation with, which is the legal reformistic paradigm that is to say we are going to change german society towards socialism but through law through peaceful piecemeal transformation so there is an idea that in fact we are leading to the same thing is a socialist society post-capitalist society but not through violence to destruction through the things that we are, they are already uh, knowing and seeing that what's happening in uh, in the Soviet Union at the time. It was also the civil war going on, and it was all these problems that Lenin and all his comrades had to solve, uh, Trotsky and the others, and so on. So they knew that. So from then on, we are going to have uh, the high time of this first lineage of legal reformism to bring about the socialist society through law. And uh, we are going to see a new generation of leftist uh, lawyers, most of them lawyers, uh, law professors, some. Uh, and these people are the ones that are going to lead them this uh, paradigm forward. It is an exciting period in which one of the key figures, not very well known in the West, but uh, it was one of the key figures was Hugo, uh, Zinsheimer. Uh, Zinsheimer was a lawyer, labor law uh, lawyer, and uh, he felt precisely that in the labor issues, because there was a trade union movement, a very strong trade union movement in Germany, the trade unionists were already talking with the employers to bring about social contracts, collective bargaining, and therefore even outside the state. So they felt that there was something new was coming up, is that the society, when it is organized in different and opposed groups, trade unions on one side, employers on the other side, they managed to come together and to bring about solutions, legal solutions for the workers that also can be accommodated by the employers. And therefore, this is an ex that's where the labor law begins, in fact. The idea that labor law is not private law is something different because it's collective uh, public law uh, being created outside the state and then eventually being recognized by the state. So it is really a very exciting period because it's a period full of contradictions, theoretical uh, contradictions. When I studied uh, my first encounter with this was in Germany uh, after uh, in 19, um, late 60s, in second part of late 60s, in Berlin, in West Berlin, at the time divided by the wall, the Berlin Wall, and in fact, it was uh, they were trying to revive all this exciting tradition of discussions in the twenties, which was a very exciting discussion, because on one side they wanted to defend the liberal tradition of law, the idea that the law, law is an autonomous field, is something that is not politics, is something else, but it can be used for political purposes but we have to defend and analyze the autonomy of law through a new science that was emerging legal science doctrina juridica as we say in portuguese so the legal science was emerging then and the big figure behind that movement was hans kelsen hans kelsen was producing a pure theory of law a very interesting liberal theory but which is not very much concerned with social transformation is to defend the law hans kelsa was jewish and he was really afraid of the political infringement of law he was really very uh, afraid that through law one could in fact start the persecution of jews his opponent was another very important figure. Probably people today know him better than they know Hans Kelsen, Carl Schmitt. Because Carl Schmitt at the time is a legal theorist also. But he says of the that the, the politics is the priority. Our societies are about politics. 
and the political power. And law is at the service of political power. But you can understand why later on Carl Schmitt is going to be the, theory, the theoretician behind Hitler, of course. But th that's the idea. And this idea is a critical idea that at that time does not sound as extreme right. It could also sound as extreme left. Because all of us in the critical tradition always believe that law is not fully autonomous. Law is that uh, is connected with politics in one way or the other, and when it claims to be autonomous, is where it is becomes more sus subservient, because when law is really positivistic, the idea of autonomy is at the service of the oppressors of the dominant classes, and therefore there is this tension between the liberal tradition and social transformation through law. So Hugo Zinsheimer, his uh, students, he was a lawyer in Frankfurt, and these students were marvelous people, all of them Jews, as he himself, and all of them have to immigrate after uh, uh, Hitler came to power. Hugo uh, died in 1945 in Antwerp, in Holland. And all his students, some of them became very famous in legal theory and international relations. Uh, Hans Morgenthau was his student. Uh, Otto uh, Freund, Kahn Freund was his student. Franz uh, 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 Neumann that published uh, Behemoth, uh, a beautiful treatise on, on the Hitler state. All these people start from this law office in which all these discussions were taking place. So there were these tensions between the liberal tradition and uh, the political transformation. It was clear then that this idea of bringing about socialism through law was a very complicated issue. In Weimar, the main opposition were the, the judges. Uh, some people that are now in Portugal or in Brazil understand very well, or in Colombia or in Mexico, the conservative nature of the judicial, the judiciary. They tend to be very conservative. And they were conservative. Why are they conservative? That's a different question. We can discuss it in the debate. But they tended to be very conservative. So the Weimar people, in fact, uh, Rosa Luxemburg had been condemned by the judges and so on. And uh, there were purges on the communists at that time by, by the courts. Uh, and it was very clear that the courts in Weimar has a, had a, a double standard, which was very interesting to analyze some things that are happening today in the world. Is that whenever there were crimes, and there were crimes committed by the extreme left, because they, they were violent at the time also. It was a violent struggle. The, punish, the punishment was enormous, very heavy. You know, almost endless uh, prison sentences. When the violence came from the extreme right, they were very lenient, very small fines, very small imprisonment sent, double standards, vis-a-vis -vis the extreme right violence and the extreme left violence. So the judge were conservative. So the idea was that the legal reformers have to go through two avenues. One was the interpretation of law, try to force new interpretations of law, because they knew that, um, and against Kelsen, that there were many different interpretations of law are possible, uh, that law doesn't say everything, that it can be interpreted because there are words, there, there is a language. So the language is ambiguous. So there could be different interpretations of law. But then the second, uh, the second move would be legislation, legislative uh, transformation. Of course, there were two different modes of operating because in judiciary, you rely on lawyers and on judges. In the legislative process, you have to rely on politics. We have to bring in politics because of the parliaments. It has to go through the parliaments and to the executive. So there were two models, and this was very interesting because it was a serious debate and a, a very interesting debate uh, in this period. So this is the first phase of the legal reformism in which we have uh, this. Uh, it's not a long period. It's very European. For Europe at the time, the rest of the world does not count. 95% of the world is under influence of Europe, either as colonies or as, uh, subjected to the countries like China at the time. So it is really a very small world, the European world. So when we, uh, that's why I start by saying this is European story, that it's going to change as we are going to see. 
But everything changes from 1933 onwards. As you know, Hitler came to power through elections. There was no coup. There were elections in 1932. And uh, only after he was in power, he really did the coup and uh, became uh, uh, the Nazi state. Well, from then on, uh, there was no opportunity for legal reformism anymore. On the contrary, they were trying to liquidate all the relative autonomy of the judges, replacing judges, imprisonment of judges, uh, you know, um, sometimes even assassination of judges. Many of them went, uh, they were a little bit progressive, went into exile and so on and so forth. And legislation, of course, nothing because the legislative now was uh, Hitler. So there was the high time for Carl Schmitt. In fact, politics, the sovereign had all the power. And Carl Schmitt was very influential at the time. Well, it ended this story. Many of these people, the emigres, all the sociology of law, international relations that we know in the United States comes from this tradition. All of them came into the United States, most of them in the United States, not Europe, because of the conditions here, and uh, they developed their theories there. Then the Second World War, there is the second uh, uh, phase of uh, legal reformism, and uh, this second phase starts up the Second World War. And it is different, because it is obvious that after the Second World War, we have the world divided in two. On one side, we have the, the Soviet world, the socialist bloc. On the other side, you have the capitalist bloc. And it is a time in which the colonies are giving signs that they don't want to continue as colonies. They are rebellions. And there have been already many rebellions, particularly in India. So it is a period in which we are going to have a different kind of legal reformism. This legal reformism now uh, ceases to be a project to bring about socialist societies. Even though some of the ideas are still socialist, the names and so on, socialist parties, for instance, but socialism is not uh, there anymore. The idea, in fact, is to try to create compatibility between uh, liberal democracy and capitalism. And uh, this uh, compatibility is being brought about by law, by legal reformism. And therefore, if you have collective rights, individual rights, human rights, all these things are going to discipline capital because capital tends to be savage by nature because it's led by infinite accumulation. So if it is infinite accumulation, I, I have to accumulate. I can even commit crimes, but that's the logic. It's destructive. It's creative and destructive at the same time. That's the genius of capitalism. So, but this idea of infinite uh, accumulation collides with the principle of democracy, which on this side of the world came to dominate. And the principle is the popular sovereignty. The popular, the people. The people are the ones that govern. That's the principle of, of liberal democracy. Government of the majority to the benefit of the majority. Well. So we are going to see the second wave of legal reformism that happens only in the capitalist side of the world because the world is divided into sides, right? And in this side, in fact, the idea is to bring about a kind of a civilized capitalism. And the civilized capitalism is going to have a name in Europe that still persists today. It's called social democracy. That is to say, a democracy with social rights. Because liberal democracy at the beginning was really democracy uh, consisting of civil and political rights. Through social democracy, we are going to have social and economic, and later on, uh, environment rights and so on. So women's rights, indigenous rights, first of all, the workers' rights, labor laws, and so on. All this is going to be social democracy. But social democracy is uh, a version of capitalist society. It's not a non-capitalist society. So this second wave is going to be very strong because as again, at the beginning is only uh, an European story, but things are changing. And uh, 
right after the war, we are going to see changes in the world that are going to pose the, the rest of the world, so to say, confronted with the idea that there is a revolutionary way to bring about social progress, Soviet Union, and there is a, another way to bring about social progress, the legal reformist, the capitalistic democratic model. One is claiming to be socialist, the other is capitalism. The socialists say that they are the only ones that will bring about equality because capitalism cannot bring about equality. And social democracy claims that it can combine equality with freedom, which is not possible on the other side of the Soviet Union because they may really have equality, but no freedom. On the other side, we are going to have probably not full equality, but we are going to have freedom. So this is the debate of the Cold War. But this is an European story, as I say. But what about these colonies that are fighting for independence? The social movements, the anti-colonial movements, the liberation movements, Gandhi in India, and Nehru and all these movements for the independence. Well, in 1955, they meet in Bandung, and in Bandung, they are going to, to meet uh, in the, in, at the time, it's Indonesia, uh, is in Bandung, and in Bandung, they are going to meet to think there were 29 countries. There were some uh, uh, socialist countries, for instance, Yugoslavia, um, but there were others from uh, other countries, uh, from uh, Indonesia, from Malaysia, and from uh, liberation movements from all over the world. And uh, these people decide to have a third way, neither the capitalist Western way nor the Soviet Union socialist way. They want a third way. And uh, that's the moment later on, a few years later, 1961, when the, a new movement is, emerges called the non-aligned movement. The movement of non-aligned, that is to say, we want to be independent. We don't want to follow the European models, be it the socialist or the capitalist. We want a different one. And the different one varies enormous. Some of them were closer to the capitalist European one. Others were closer to the Soviet Union model. So, but they are in fact posing uh, the idea of legal reformism on a different level. So for instance, India, 1947, becomes independent and becomes independent as a democracy, respecting the rule of law and therefore creating all the institutions that could bring about social progress through law. India is going to be an experiment in uh, legal reformism from then on. It's very important, very interesting. In Africa, we are going to see that one, uh, one decade later, 1955, we are going to have uh, 1965, the independence, the first independence, Ghana, for instance, with Nkrumah, and uh, all these people are going to be confronted with these two paradigms, or the more uh, revolutionary way, or a more democratic, uh, legal way. And in Latin America, we had in 1959, the idea that after all, this idea of legal reformism doesn't do it, doesn't bring about socialism. If you want to be socialist, you have to be a revolutionary. And that's the Cuban revolution, 1959. And all of a sudden there is a, a great clamor around the world because Cuba is on the Western side, it's not on the Soviet side. So it confuses things. And the United States is going to react in a brutal way to crush Cuba. And they have been doing that for 50 years now, as you know. And they have not been able to eliminate, destroy Cuba, but they have confined Cuba. Uh, that's what they wanted. Because Cuba at the time, the revolution would go everywhere in Europe, uh, in, in Latin America. That was Fidel's and Che Guevara's particular ideas, particularly Che Guevara the first victim of this when he was uh, assassinated in Bolivia, uh, probably through a complot in which the Soviet KGB services and CIA convened and coalesced to destroy, to eliminate Che Guevara. It's a story that is not yet very well told in the world. But in any case, the United States begins really a way of confinement. And this idea of confinement brings the idea of legal reformism. And Kennedy is the first one with the, the Alliance for Progress is an idea that through law, you can bring, for instance, uh, Kennedy 
uh, immediately 1962. He proclaims that uh, uh, Latin America needs an agrarian reform. And so the laws of agrarian reform, uh, so that we are going to have more distribution of land. Uh, and therefore the revolutionary impulse behind the Cuban revolution will be destroyed because the people will have a more, a better welfare. So in a sense, trying to bring about social change through law. Well, it didn't work because the, uh, in fact, the funds that were, uh, uh, this is the story today is very well known, documented. The funds that were available for the Alliance for Progress were very minimal because the Congress didn't uh, liberate the funds. Besides, all these reforms have to be conducted with the cooperation of the elites in Latin America. And the elites in Latin America want the concentration of land, be it Colombia, be it Mexico, be it Brazil. They didn't want the gradient reform anymore. So they blocked any idea of social justice. And that's why you are going to have a very convoluted system in the, with dictatorships and so on up until the mid 80s. But there is a movement, a very interesting movement for, for us from the legal reformist point of view of this paradigm is Allende. Allende in 1970 in Chile, Salvador Allende, democratic elective, uh, is going to do what the Weimar Republic wanted to do and failed, bring about socialism through law. So he was elected. And you want to change laws so that we could bring about social change. But in fact, it didn't have majority in the Congress. Uh, the judges were very conservative, as in Weimar. So it was very difficult for Salvador Allende. But as you can see, that was an excitement about that. Because after all, it was the alternative to Cuba. <laughs> because uh, Cuba was the revolutionary, violent, so to say, to crush the elites, while Salvador Allende was democratic but also socialist. So it is very, a very interesting attempt, but it lasts for three years. In 1973, the 9-11 of Latin America is, non, is not the 9-11 of the Twin Towers, is the 9-11 of September 1973, when uh, Allende committed suicide, but of course under the, all the pressure of the CIA and of the, the military, Pinochet uh, military uh, leader at the time. So it was really a coup by the CIA against uh, Salvador Allende. It is well documented today. Kissinger was a very important figure behind that. So, and uh, that the ideas of a democratic socialism were crushed for, uh, for a while. And uh, so we are going to have populism, Getulio Vargas in Brazil. We had Getulio Vargas in Brazil before. Peron, they are different models. They don't rely on these ideas of the rule of law. They're, they are, I'm not going into that because it uh, does not fit my, the paradigm and model of legal reformism, which is my topic. So in fact, we are going to have these uh, uh, periods of uh, struggle, social struggle, progressive social struggle, for instance, for land reform, and then, uh, you know, dictatorship. In, 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 uh, in Argentina, 76, and uh, in Brazil, 1964, and it lasted until the 80s. And uh, the transition in, uh, in Brazil lasts until 85, 86, and we have the constitution 1988. So it is a new period. So this second period is a period in which we have already not a European story, it's also a story that goes around the world in which the same paradigms of law and revolution pop up. And usually uh, neither revolution is very successful nor law is very successful. At the time, China is not present. When I, I, I wrote the first edition of this, China is almost no, not mentioned because China was not there. Uh, that's what I have to account in the, the new book that I'm uh, writing now. So I think that uh, during this period, uh, you are going to have, and I'm going to concentrate on 1985 uh, period, we are going to have two movements that go in the same direction. And now we'll see the context in which I write the text which is assigned for today and please read very closely because it's as close as I went to develop a social theory in general, a general social theory of society and the social legal theory can lobby emancipatory. And it's uh, written uh, 
at the late 90s, beginning of the 2000s. And so I have now to account in the second class why I have to revisit this text and produce a different text. But before that, I have to account for this period, the 80s until 2000. And this period is a very, a very interesting period. It's a period in which in Europe, we are going to see the decay of the Soviet bloc. Uh, it's clear from the 80s onwards, and then uh, in 1989 collapse. This is the, symbolically the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the revolutionary paradigm seems to be in crisis, total crisis, fatal crisis. Cuba is confined as a revolution, just a small country, and China is not there yet, even though since 1978, they were already building a powerhouse of the economy, but it was not very well known uh, at the time. So what we have then is that with this collapse, it looks like that legal reformism, transformation through the rule of law, through democracy, through human rights, as the field. So it is now the only game in town. So let's advance with the legal reformism, illusion. At that precise moment starts the crisis of legal reformism through law. Because it's the moment in which neoliberalism as a global model for capitalism begins to speak of the overload of democracy, as they say in the Trilateral Commission of 1975, democracy are producing too many rights. And because the, the workers, the peasants, the women, they have too many rights and uh, democracy becomes unmanageable, the state becomes unmanageable. So we have to reduce rights, particularly economic rights. So that is the crisis of social democracy, is the crisis of uh, social legal reformism. That's the crisis. In Europe is called the crisis of social democracy up until today. That's the phase up until today. But in Latin America it's different because they become democracies. Some countries, some countries went through different periods. The, the democratization in, in Mexico is a different period because they have a revolutionary party pre for many decades after the Mexican revolution. Other countries were democracies all the time, but democracy with state of emergency, permanent state of emergency, the case of Colombia, and therefore they were different countries, right? But you are going to have a kind of a surge of democ democracy then with democratization period in Brazil, with democratization process also in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina, and later on in, uh, in Chile. All these are uh, giving new, new life through legal reformism. But it's a very thin legal reformism because it occurs at the moment in which neoliberalism is controlling the global economy. So when, for instance, the military uh, abandon power in a pacted way in Brazil, the pact is that democracy is going to come with neoliberalism, with a very liberalized privatization, liberalization, uh, uh, shrinking of the state, the state is corrupt, the state is inefficient, all this. But it is a very contradictory period because many of the Democrats that were fighting for democracy in Argentina, in Brazil, and also in Chile, really believe that through law you can bring about a transformation. So there is a tense period of legal reformism that is not very well uh, unified not unified at all, but you are going to see social movements. For instance, 1985, the MST in Brazil emerges and the MST emerges with the idea of a land reform. And land reform, not, not revolution. They are Marxist, okay, but they don't want to bring about revolution. They want to bring about land re reform in a capitalist country. So we are going to witness lots of social movements that struggle for, uh, social justice through law. And this is uh, legal reformism. At the end of the 90s, this thing changes, in a sense, qualitatively, because there are governments, progressive governments that arrive into power. Several of them in Latin America. Latin America at that point, while Europe is in a big crisis, 
And uh, Africa is really dealing with, still with colonialism and uh, the Portuguese uh, African colonies uh, are struggling uh, to overcome the socialist period after the independence to become capitalist countries, very dependent countries, Angola, Mozambique, and all the others. So, but uh, uh, Latin America is going to be very interesting in this period because it's the idea that, in fact, you can combine democracy and capitalism, but then to become more socially conscious socially responsible capitalism all this through law that's why it is legal reformism so but you are going to have a very strong impact because you are not going just to change the law you are going to change the state and the first uh, uh, event in this direction is uh, 1998 hugo chavez in venezuela in which here in fact through elections there was a coup of course we know that but then he tries to legitimize through elections a kind of a revolution. But you know that is a different revolution from the European Revolution, because the revolutions in Europe were against democracy. While in Latin America, we are going to see a combination between democracy and revolution. So for Hugo Chavez is a Bolivarian revolution. Then a bit later, 2006, the Bolivian Evo Morales revolution against democracy, elected democratically, and a communitarian revolution. Around the same time, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, another revolution, citizen revolution. The same way, through law, through legal reform, will bring about a revolution. It is not a revolution in the European sense or in the Cuban sense. It's a strong version of legal reformism. And they, because they want to be strong, they are going to add a dimension on legal reformism that didn't exist in Europe. And that's why it's very interesting, this uh, is the Constitution. All of them focus on changes in the constitutions. Brazil had the 1988, Colombia had one in 1999, in 1991, and all these countries are going to produce new constitutions. I was a consultant to do two of them, the Constitution of Bolivia and the Constitution to Ecuador. Um, so they were really new things. They were really trying to bring a profound reform of the state. So it was a very strong legal reformist. Well, how do I account for that? Well, in Brazil, it was uh, the legal reformism. It was not revolutionary in any way. Uh, Lula da Silva in 2003 said, what I want to do in Brazil is a, an European style social democracy. And Lula da Silva lamented that while Europe was abandoned social democracy, the Brazilians were getting it, were really trying to promote it. And they said, you poor Europeans, why are you abandoning these precious things called social democracy? And you are going to have uh, uh, in that period until 2014, you are going to have legal reformism through law uh, in Brazil in many ways, reproductive rights, anti-racism and so on, Maria da Pagno, all this is legal reformism in different fields. With some defeats, uh, for instance, land reform it didn't advance uh, a lot, but where, you know, territories were demarcated of the indigenous people. We are very, uh, I most personally very much involved in one of them, Raposa Serra do Sol in uh, Roraima, and uh, they were really transformations. I remember very well being at the STF, uh, the, the, the federal Supreme Court in Brazil, uh, discussing with the judges why, in my view, they should really demarcate the land to the, the indigenous. Because, in fact, they were there before uh, the modern state. It was not the state that had to recognize their rights. Uh, the, the, their rights were prior to the modern capitalist colonial state. And, in fact, the land was demarcated then. Uh, so there was a period in which we are going to have a strong legal reformism with a backlash that starts, in fact, in the second decade, uh, with the crisis in Venezuela, crisis in Brazil, crisis in Ecuador, crisis in Brazil, in, in Bolivia, we are going to see that. So I write the, the can lobby, can lobby at the beginning of that period, end of the 90s, early 2000. And uh, at that period, I'm very, I try to account theoretically, that's the topic of this book, 
in two ways, because now it's more the, the narrative, how you theorize this. Well, I theorize this in two ways. The first one is at the global level by bringing out a distinction between hegemonic globalization, neoliberal globalization, and the counter hegemonic globalization. The globalization of social movements that was uh, very clear manifested in the World Social Forum that met for the first time in Brazil, in Porto Alegre in 2001. And I was very active in the foundation of the World Social Forum, Forum and in continuation up until today. So the idea that the social movements are all also using globalization, that is to say transnational type of cooperation to bring about other solutions, other progressive justice oriented type of solutions, not at the national scale, but at the global scale. So on one side, you have the, the economic forum in Davos, and on the other side, you have the World Social Forum. So there was a, an apparent symmetry at the time. And at the second level is at the national level. What are the struggles going on? I was uh, studying the struggles, for instance, of the MST in uh, Brazil through law. Uh, in some cases, even though the judiciary is conservative, there were very interesting victories for the occupation of land of the MST in Brazil, in Pontal de Paranapanema, in Sao Paulo, in many other regions. And why, with a popular lawyer that became my student later on and did PhD with me here, Flavia Carle, uh, we studied uh, all this process, how you could do popular lawyering. So you were emerging this class of uh, popular lawyers that were lawyers that were very more involved with the social movements. Uh, they were providing technical assistance to the movements, but they were lawyers. And they pleaded in court. And they were very interesting in their type of lawyering because they were not neutral. They were with the social movement, but they wanted to respect the liberal tradition of law as it is laid out in the courts. So their discourse in the courtroom was a legal uh, discourse, not a political discourse. So very good tradition in Latin America of popular lawyers, which in fact was following a tradition in the 70s that I had known in the States when I was writing my PhD thesis for Yale. Uh, they were the radical lawyers and the public interest, in law, public interest lawyers. All of them were popular lawyers in a sense. They were trying to bring about legal change and through legal change, political change. So again, democracy and capitalism compatible. So that is the, the, the soul, the principle of legal reformism in the second wave is that. So I write the, the, the kernel of emancipatory. I would like just to mention two or three traits of this. The, the, the class will go a bit longer if you allow me because I think I want to finish this part of my lecture, but I think the hours are going. Uh, uh, but it's very important that you bring in mind so that you can relate to the next class. Is that my main idea, sociological idea, the social theory that I bring about, uh, starting from the critical uh, sociology, which has always been my, my brand of sociology. I see that societies, capitalist modern societies, are ruled by two a tension between two movements, the movement of regulation and the movement of emancipation. That is to say the idea that societies must be regulated, but the regulator, regulation is not ever sufficient. There are people that complain against that regulation and want a better regulation, and they bring about emancipatory movements that are leading to new regulations, but better regulation, more rights for the workers, collective rights for the women, anti-racist rights, affirmative actions. That is to say, they are trying to do all this in a kind of a way that moves in this direction. So a tension between regulation and emancipation. The regulation is based on three principles. And I'm telling you this because I still subscribe to this uh, to a great extent. It's still my theory of society, even though changed along the lines that I'll uh, uh, bring about in next class. Three principles, the principle of the state, the principle of the market, and the principle of the community. They are the three principles. I don't go into that. And emancipation 
three principles of rationality, of emancipatory uh, ideas, the ex aesthetic expressive, the moral practice of the law in politics, and the technical scientific of science. So modern science and modern politics are always together in this uh, paradigm of modern capitalist societies. So regulation and emancipation. And I see this tension. What is the legal reformism? Is the management of the tension. Because legal reformism starts from the regulation that exists, but wants a different and a better regulation, and therefore strives for emancipation. So legal reformism is this, this bridge, the tension, the management of tension between a regulation and emancipation. It's very clear to have that in mind so that you can understand where I'm now, uh, a bit different from this, right? But then it's very important to know that these uh, movement that I analyzed at the end of the ninth beginning of 2000, even though we are going to have all these progressive uh, countries and governments, I'm skeptical already at the time. And I'm, uh, the, the, the text, the, this uh, text is, um, I like this text a lot, probably are going to publish it autonomously because I like it so much. It's been published autonomously in Brazil actually. And uh, is, is because I really feel that the, the neoliberalism is already there and undermining all these uh, victories, all these struggles and all these ideas of legal reformism. I can see the tension towards social polarization very clear in, in Europe and I can see outside that. I see that because I was living part of the year, uh, these 35 years in the United States, I could see how the United States were moving to the right. Uh, and uh, Europe also. So legal reformism, the Supreme Court in the United States used to be a very progressive instance. And I saw that it was becoming very conservative with the nominations of the new judges. As later, I, you, you would see under Trump. Uh, and now it's a very conservative government, uh, 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 Supreme Court. So I could see that tension already there. So that's why I focus my uh, uh, text uh, in a radical understanding and diagnostics of society with two concepts that I'd like you to bear in mind. One is the demise of the social contract, which I see emerging that the social contract is being replaced by individual contractualism. And therefore the principles of social responsibility are being replaced by principles of individual guilt. I'm poor because the society is unjust, Social responsibility, so, so, social responsibility. I'm poor because it's my fault, it's guilt. So neoliberalism was already undermining the idea of social responsibility and replacing it by the idea of individual guilt. So I could see that. So that's the demise of social contract. And the demise of social contract leads us to the rise of social fascism. So that's an, another theoretical innovation, which I'd like you to pay attention to read the text, I cannot go into that, is the four forms of social fascism. Because I, I'm trying to claim that we live in societies that are political democratic but socially fascistic. Because there are many people that cannot enjoy democracy. You know, you have, you know, papers, newspapers every day with different political opinions. What is the usage of it if I don't have money to buy the newspaper? So I was concerned that the social polarization and the economic polarization was, an, uh, you know, eroding all the rights. So social fascism is my concept. And then another one, which is uh, the three civil societies. I never accept the liberal idea of the civil society, but it is typical of my work. I start from the hegemonic ideas and do a twist. Uh, Lucretius, so an action with, uh, uh, clean up and uh, it doesn't matter now to go into that. It's, it's a, a twist in the theory to make it counter hegemonic. So I distinguish three civil societies. The, civil, the privilege, which is the intimate, the strange civil society and the uncivil civil society. So this later, later uh, version, the latter form is the form of the people subject to social fascism. So this makes a connection to the falling class. But I was also, very attentive that against this trend there were reactions there were all these work that i've been doing 
where the popular lawyers in Brazil, in Colombia, that exist also in Colombia, very strong, and other law professors and sociologists throughout the continent that were working on legal reformism. And I was very much with them and doing this work with them. So I could see that they were really trying to revive on the margins the idea of legal reformism. And that's why I came with the concept of subaltern cosmopolitan legality. That is to say, these people, these popular lawyers, were probably not able to change the law. So at this point, the legislation was very difficult to bring about. But they were fighting in courts, fighting for women, fighting for indigenous people, fighting for the MST, fighting for the small agriculture families and so on, uh, fighting for ecological issues in courts. And they use all the contradictions of liberal theory because at the time uh, there was possibilities in law in Brazil in many societies that some changes could bring about. So what was the secret of this counter hegemonic? Uh, pay attention to this word because you are going to uh, listen more about the counter hegemony as one of the sociology emergencies. In this text is the only sociology emergencies, counter hegemony. The secret for the popular lawyers is that they combine politics with law. They never go to courts before they politicize the movement. They bring about, they, they try that the movement becomes stronger in the streets by protests, by manifs, by uh, strikes. So when the political movement is strong, they go to courts. So they try to press the judicial interpretation based on uh, the strength of the political movement, even though politics cannot get into the courtroom. But the judges are citizens. They know what's going on in the societies. They know a, a strong movement of peasants, for instance, of landless peasants, and they pay attention in interpretation, and they can change the interpretation. So that's the crux. The, the, the secret and the core of the legal reformism is precisely this, combining political mobilization with juridical or legal mobilization. And I go into the text uh, in the different uh, ways in which I see this articulation coming in. And that's what I think is the, uh, the soul of the second phase of legal reformism. Well, I, I, I want to now to bring the bridge in the 15 minutes that I still allow myself, if you allow me uh, to do this, uh, to tell you where I'm now so that we can discuss that next class. In order to do that, uh, uh, first uh, two minutes on my journey, personal journey, because I start my sociology of law in 1970, doing research in a favela in Rio de Janeiro. I was at the time discussing legal reformism very strongly at my, at the time, the law school at Yale, in which we were discussing all these issues. My training was becoming more and more Marxist. My, I didn't become a Marxist in, in Germany. I became a Marxist in, in the United States. And um, at the time, I was very critical of legal reformism because I was reading about the Weimar experience and I said, well, this in the end comes to nothing. And uh, there were two ways of doing this critique. One was the critical ideology, the critique of ideology. There was the critical legal studies uh, done at Harvard. And we at Yale were very much more concerned with empirical critical sociology of law. So we were doing critical sociology of law. So I was, since I didn't trust the state very much at the time, I did my research with the squatter settlements in Rio. It was dictatorship in Brazil. So it was not legal reformism. It was the idea that the actors, social actors, have alternative ways of law. They're not official laws, but they are other laws. So legal pluralism came into my field at the time. So there was, a, my period was at the time, uh, very, uh, very close uh, on this. And then when later on in the 80s and the 90s, I began to understand more the complexities of law of these popular lawyers who taught me a lot. And though I became more 
attentive to the possibilities of progressive transformation. And in fact, I have a, a very unlikely master that probably, uh, and uh, master in the good sense of the, of the word, the best sense, was the Archbishop uh, Elder Camera, Dom Elder Camera from Olinda Recife, Recife Olinda, because this uh, 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 Archbishop in 1980, when I was doing another research in Recife, in the Mocambos, which is the peripheral uh, communities in Recife, he also promoted the political movement, the political organization to press the courts. So he was doing the, in fact, political mobilization to bring about legal transformation. It was dictatorship, 1980. So this bishop, which then was really very badly treated by the anti-communist Pope, uh, Jean Paul II, so, but it was a fabulous person at the time. So I think that uh, when I saw all this coming, I also saw the coming of the, the tide of counter-revolution, of counter-reformism. So my last uh, words are precisely on these 20 years after I wrote that piece, so that you understand my next class. And uh, what I saw basically was the confirmation of what was in this text, but more dramatically. I saw that in these 20 years, that in fact, neoliberalism was making a, a deep transformation in law without being noticed by lawyers or by sociologists. I had had a very good uh, master here, Karl Renner, uh, that in, in Austria had taught me that sometimes law changes function without changing the law, the law changes function without any changes in the, the words of the law. So I was noticing that democracy and the rule of law that were underlying legal reformism was uh, going through a major change that was absolutely unnoticed. What was the change? Is that up until then, the countries outside Europe have been struggling to be democratic. The ones that did want the socialist uh, solution, they were struggling to be democratic, to have rule of law, to have independent courts and so on. That was a struggle. All of a sudden, neoliberalism says it's not a struggle, it's a condition. You cannot have humanitarian aid to development or humanitarian aid if you are not democratic, if you don't abide by the rule of law. All of a sudden, the rule of law and democracy is not a conquest of the people. It's an imposition. And an imposition from outside by imperial powers. Is the same rule of law? Is the same democracy? No, it's a different one. But it has the same name. And people get confused because they, they think that the United States is struggling. In this case, it's the United States. Basically, the European Union comes much later is really promoting democracy and rule of law. But what kind of democracy? What kind of rule of law? Well, this democracy is a democracy only with the civic and political rights, not with economic rights. So it's very much against economic rights and social rights. And rule of law is precisely conservative courts, no social transformation through law. So this imposition is very interesting because now, up until then, in the 60s, political science was focused on the idea that in order to you, a country, a uh, less developed country, let's assume this, this word, which I don't like, um, has to struggle to be democratic. For that, there are conditions. You have to diminish social polarization, concentration of land. You need an agrarian reform. Conditions for democracy was, in fact, Kennedy's idea, 1962. And all of a sudden, there are no conditions for democracy. Democracy is the condition for everything else. And therefore, it's a poor democracy. It's a democracy with social rights, with land reform, with nothing. So the counter-reformism begins, and is being called deregulation. So the big name in the mid 2000 is the concept of deregulation. Deregulate the economy, liberalize the economy, privatize the economy, uh, privatize the public services, privatize education, privatize health, 
privatized transportation because the state is inefficient or corrupt predator uh, only the markets are the really rationalized democracy and rule of law completely different from the social democracy of the, pre the prior period so i could see that this counter reformism because it's not to bring about a better society is to destroy the rights that had been created in the previous period in many countries to neutralize them to neutralize as they are now going that's why this conference in glasgow will be a failure neutralizing even eco ecological rights that have been you know developed throughout this period so it's the idea that you fight against anything that is an obstacle to capitalist accumulation. Environmental laws can be an obstacle. So in the, the IMF goes to Africa and says, don't pass economic, uh, ecological laws because ecological laws will be an obstacle to investment, to capital accumulation. So this is the reactionary, I would say, counter-reformistic why it is the, the call, called deregulation you don't see any deregulation i analyzed the official the bulletin official diario the republica the official uh, 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 papers where they publish all the laws in a country do you know that all these uh, books these periodics they are daily sometimes in many countries they grew and grew and grew so there was deregulation but there were more and more laws because in order to deregulate, you need laws. That is to say, it is not deregulation, it's re-regulation. It's to change one regulation, more state-oriented, more public interest-oriented by a private interest-oriented. A market-friendly, as they call it, market-friendly democracy, market-friendly um, uh, re rule of law. So this is this is the situation that uh, we are in now. This counter-reformism uh, is really leading the way in many countries. It's not just it was the first phase was deregulation. The second phase was a very active way of training judges so that they would become more conservative. The United, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I knew very well because I was at the time in Wisconsin and, and uh, my school, the Wisconsin Medicine, was the one that was behind all the investment to train judges in Soviet Union, to train judges in Poland, in Hungary, uh, and also in Latin America. And this training started in the 90s and went into the 20s, 2000s, up until now. Sergio Moro in Brazil is probably very well known of you now, the Brazilians here. It was a, a child of this process. All of them went through legal training in, uh, in the United States. A legal, very specific training is this training that I just told you about this uh, counter reformistic type of law. Was it an independent type of uh, judicial system that was being created? Well, it was not independent. It was independent in the sense that it was ready to fight against progressive governments because they were the progressive governments that have been leading the legal reformism, progressive laws. But they were not independent of the oligarchies, of the conservative parties, of the elites of the countries. Because in fact, many of them are children of those elites in the judiciary, prosecutors, and uh, judges and therefore they were already very conservative as in weimar it became more so i analyzed that in this book you have, you have a chapter on how the united states trained the prosecutors in colombia it's very interesting the amount of money that was put in the training and that it was the training of the brazilian judges and uh, it it led in fact to the the infamous uh, project of the lava jato the, infamous operation in my view because it is the liberal legalism becoming liberal illegality because it's in fact full of illegalities so this is almost the paroxysm of counter reformism i conclude is the legal reformism dead the idea that you can bring about a better society by legal reforms 
Well, that's a question mark for me. But I think that I cannot be as uh, optimist. I was always a tragic optimist, always aware of the difficulties. But I think that a new theory is necessary to account for the current period. And my theory does not account enough for that period. Because uh, I think that you have to have uh, alternatives. Uh, that's the idea of progressive thinking. But I don't see these alternatives the way I wrote them down. Because many of these initiatives were backlashed were neutralized and had a bad, bad, bad result. So I think that now we have to, as uh, intellectuals, uh, theoreticians, we have to account for this new period. Are we entering a post-legal reformism period? Uh, what is that? It's a monster? It's a new reality? We see that something that is going to guide our next lecture is that look at this note that i provide you at the end neoliberalism is trying to reduce democracy to political and civic rights the extreme right as it is rising in many countries is crushing the political and civic rights so after having neutralized the social and economic rights, I think now the strategy now is to neutralize, destroy the civic and political rights and the rise of extreme right throughout the world. In this country, as well as in Brazil and many other countries, is a sign that the compatibility between democracy and capitalism is in real danger. How do I theorize that is the topic of next slides. Thank you very much. A period of questions now. I'm sorry for this was one hour and a half. So, so you endure, you are good students or so, oh, thank you. Don't ask me questions about my theory because that's the topic of next class. You know? Otherwise, you'll have another half 90 minutes of lectures. You don't want that, neither do I. Okay, good. Good morning. Your name, everyone. please. Uh, my name is Wagner. Wagner. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor. I really appreciated it. It was quite inspiring for me. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, actually, you touched th these points, uh, but I'd like to hear you uh, a little bit more. Uh, first one uh, is about counter-reformism and this process of re-regulation uh, because it's an important question to me uh, because in Brazil we we're suffering this in a pretty hard way, this process of deregulation, but through uh, uh, the, the process of uh, creating new, new, new law. Uh, and one thing that is pretty pretty important to me in my point of view is the process of uh, comprom uh, com compromising the public budget uh, in 2016 uh, we had a constitu constitutional amendment uh, number 95 called in portuguese teto de gastos <clears throat> it implied uh, in uh, imposing a constraint to the social expenditures uh, in a way to uh, I secure that the state would be able to pay the public debt, uh, the financial expenditures, and uh, it, it's not just freezing the social uh, debts as people usually talk about, but is also to create a mechanism that is going to start to uh, destroy all the public system for uh, public services, because once you have people that are getting retired in in people in public uh, services the payment of the, the retirement of these people also pressure the limit so the state won't be able to recontract uh, other people to uh, uh, be in their places and it's something that uh, 
sadly we're not talking about uh, that anymore not uh, with the uh, the the seriousness that is needed uh, and in the public uh, campaigns for the next elections uh, that people is already engaged the politicians are already engaged uh, I'm, I am not seeing this. Actually, I see just uh, Ciro Gomes talking about that, uh, but Lula and other uh, politicians from the left field, they're not talking about the heart because it implies to uh, face uh, the interests of nation institutions that are pretty strong and actually control, uh, in my point of view, the, pop, the, the, the politics in Brazil were kind of completely exposed to their uh, interests. And... I had actually the opportunity to talk with the professor Alberto Correa, that was the president uh, of the Constituent Assembly of Ecuador mm -hmm. and worked with uh, Rafael Correa in the process of accountability of the public debt in Ecuador. And it was in a lecture like this, and it was pretty obvious to me that he didn't want to answer the question I did about the public debt and the way that international uh, interests are implied in controlling public budget and to uh, uh, getting control and getting uh, this mechanism of uh, extracting the, the money from the people, you know, uh, through the state, using the state as a mechanism of improvement of people to enrich, enriching them. And- Second well, question. Second <laughs> question, sorry. Uh, it is about the, dilemma that we're facing with climate change and the conference uh, of the, the of the parties that starting is starting tomorrow and I, I think it also shows this tension between the, the 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 role of the law and this perspective of pro progressive social transformation through law and also uh, this uh, uh, the, the dilemma this uh, between uh, the role of politics and the economical interests that are also implied in this. And I'd like to hear you to talk about a little bit more about that. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Wagner. We put three questions together, if there are more questions, and then I'll, I'll answer them. We have until noon to do that, so I'll <clears throat> request. If you want to, to, to uh, ask in Portuguese, uh, do that, and then I'll translate. No, it's okay. I can do it it's in okay, English. Good. Yeah, yeah. What so many thanks, name, many thanks for the lecture. I have just your a name, your name, Sergio. Yeah, Sergio. I have just a straightforward question. How can we academics face uh, this time of the rise of the the far right uh, related to what you mentioned in the last uh, the last minutes of your lecture? And then uh, you just uh, use an example. Uh, we were in the the formation course with uh, Amy Sida a few uh, weeks ago. And he was saying that he also he has this challenge to to talk with these people that also supports, for example, Bolsonaro, and this is part of his life. But sometimes we academics we are in the I don't know in a bubble, and it's also difficult how we we communicate or at the same time how we translate what we write in articles and all these uh, outputs of academic that force us also to survive inside the system, but at the same time. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, stop us to uh, reach all these conservative way of society. You know, there is a, a, a huge abs abyss between what we publish and what these people say So uh, and believe. So my question is how also we as academics challenge the neoliberal system that we need also to survive and pay our bills. So thanks. What's up there? Hola, profesor. Yo soy Ricardo. Um, it goes more or less in what you already said about deregulation. And actually, in a text uh, speaking on uh, legal pluralism, you said ex exactly this part. Now that deregulation is also a project in which the state is involved. And the state is very protagonic in the way this deregulation happens. But at the same time, I believe what you were telling us, and I would like to hear more, is how do we uh, make a more strong argument against this way of social democracy and 
legal reformism because we have a lot of people that could work together with us to change these oppressive dynamics, but they are convinced in some way that legal reformism is the way to do the proper things because you have the danger of authoritarianism and imposition on the other side. So I, I do believe you, you are quite correct in the diagnosis you do uh, with this is destroying everything. But these people keeps defending the basis in this kind of society that doesn't exist and for many parts of the world have never existed. But you know, you have these theoreticians that defend the liberal way of thinking human rights, for instance, but they, it doesn't work. And it's happening also here in Europe that this, this is being destroyed as well. Thank you. There's an, another question up there. Um, but no, you put all the questions probably. Okay, see you. Oh, well, Edwin, my name is Edwin. Um, thank you very much for, for the lecture. So uh, you have mentioned briefly the Edwin, Edwin. Edwin. Yeah. You have mentioned briefly the, the term ecology. And I think it's, it's um, I would like to, to ask you about uh, if the, the term ecology will be compatible and applicable the division, the structure between legal reformings and, and revolution. So that's basically the, the question uh, to me because uh, nowadays it's quite crucial this, this topic in my, in my view. What, what, what do you mean environment law? Okay. Good morning, my name is Gaetano. First of all, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, so my question, you talked uh, about uh, 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 the revolution uh, made by law and against law, uh, by opposing uh, the French Revolution as a revolution made by law and the Russian Revolution as a revolution made against law. Since uh, uh, recently, I've been uh, uh, increasingly focusing on uh, uh, modern revolutions uh, for my research. I would like to ask you uh, what do you think about uh, uh, other free revolution from modernity, even if uh, modernity in itself, I know is a critical issue, but what about the English revolution, for example, the American one and the Asian one? About the American one, I think that uh, it's obvious uh, to me that uh, was made by law. But um, for uh, about the English one and the Asian one, maybe uh, the issue is a little more critical because uh, um, also with all the violence and disruption of the English Revolution, I think there, were an at uh, there was an attempt in a constitutional sense law by, for example, Lavellers and Diggers uh, through the uh, Putin debates, this for the English Revolution. And instead for the Asian Revolution, well, violence <laughs> was everywhere. But uh, Toussaint Louverture actually made uh, up a, a constitution. So, what do you think about three, these three, other three revolutions? Thank you very much. Bom dia, professor. Meu nome é Bruno. Obrigado pela palestra. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, how can we say no? How can we not say no to the question of this lecture and um, concede our answer to uh, Carl Schmitt uh, saying that the power is the very uh, root of law and uh, Michel Villiers uh, answering Kelsen ironically 
uh, about his theory of the this pure theory of law when Michel Villet says that uh, let's pretend that what sustains law it's not the power um, when we see uh, for instance in Brazil uh, a constitution 1988 that is called uh, the citizen constitution a constitution with plenty of social rights uh, included and that is torn apart in everyday life uh, is torn apart by a new way of interpreting law and judge decision uh, making in the last few years uh, that we call uh, neo-constitutionalism and how we can uh, cannot say no to this question if law can be emancipatory when we see uh, this scenery and uh, the these uh, gains of the last 20 years in brazil 30 years being torn off by neoliberalism in the last five years okay well then probably i'm going to answer this and then we'll move to others because otherwise i'll, I'll take good notes of the questions but if there are more questions I'll, uh, I'll be glad to, to answer them. Um, let's uh, go with this. The first one, Wagner, uh, um, well, it is, uh, I think, the a pack do to dos gastos, or say, the, you know, the text to dos gastos is uh, the Portuguese expression for a constitutional limit to social uh, spending over 20 years. Uh, which means that, uh, in fact, if we count on, even with inflation and so on, it is going to be a, a deterioration and even destruction of public services. And as uh, Wagner was saying, well, uh, this is the, a very good example of counter-reformism. That's what I have in mind, is that, in fact, uh, is a law, in this case, a PAC, it was, uh, you know, by the parliament, uh, that in fact is bringing about the impossibility of peaceful transformation. <laughs> because uh, since all the social policies, uh, not all of them, but most of them, uh, involve uh, spending and uh, budgetary issues, if you have really a limit, which you can go over, I think that uh, PAC is going to collapse, or is already collapsing, I think, because Bolsonaro wants to be re-elected and cannot be re-elected with that. So I think they are going to either to kick out uh, Paul Gads and the PAC or doing something else or a coup. We never know. But um, in any case, I think that's precisely what is there. But, but your question raises another different issue, is that who is behind this? Well, it's, it's clear to me today and uh, and I've been do, in this new book. I have a chapter on the on the Lava Jato, uh, because I think it's uh, is uh, you know a showcase in the world. It's probably today is being studied in the states and everywhere as uh, the most uh, grotesque uh, manipulation of law to neutralize uh, political opponents uh, with a cooperation uh, between. Uh, conservative judges and uh, mainstream media, global particularly, uh, the global media uh, concerns. So we, we know that already, we have the documents already of the interference of the United States, which are very clear. All the, all the, the data of the, the Curitiba Republic uh, were brought in by the Department of Justice of the United States very formally through Google, through the, the the, the browsers that you use in your computer because your data, your, uh, you know, banking data, they are secrets, of course, but not secrets to the national security of the United States. So the United States can use that information against you if you are, uh, in this case, uh, a left-leaning type of, very moderate type of left-leaning country or government as in Brazil. So what is this? Is something that I already theorized in another book. It's called that uh, today we cannot understand. Is um, 
the decline of the state, which is interesting because in the, the last section of the Ken Lobby Emancipatory is the state as the newest social movement. This is a, is a desperate appeal on my part that still the state can be mobilized by the popular classes to bring about progressive social change. It's a desperate. You can see the style of my, my English style. Well, you have that the Portuguese version as well. It's desperate theorizing because I know that that is probably not going to happen. But I have to theorize that that possibility still exists. And in fact, it's going to exist in the beginning through the constitutions of uh, Bolivia and Ecuador. I can see that possibility there. But what I'm trying to theorize is that now we have the, the changes. We just published a book in which is uh, coordinated by myself, organized by myself, by Sare, by Orlando, a student of ours from Aragon, Andrade from Mexico, uh, on the decolonized constitutionalism. That's the text in Portuguese, in, in English, and it'll be available also in Spanish and uh, is in Spanish is already out. Uh, and the Portuguese, no, the Portuguese is not out. It's only the Spanish one. So uh, there, it is an attempt to account for that. And in my piece, what I'm trying to articulate is that today there are two constitutionalisms, the state constitution, constitutionalism and the global constitutionalism. Because neoliberalism is a global constitutionalism with institutions, IMF and World Bank that dictate to the countries the things that they have to do, the policies. And we are entering a new period in which not even these institutions, which are already not democratic, are going to be pushed away by a smaller, more uh, uh, secret group that is going to dictate policies all over the world. It's called the Great Reset by the, uh, the World Economic Forum of Davos. If you look at the page and look what they are doing, and they are putting together five or six big, large companies, multinational companies, all the richest people, the eight richest people, all, the, all of them men and all of them white, that are uh, the, as a wealth that is as, as big as the, the wealth of the poor half of the humanity, that is to say 3.5 billion people. So these people are deciding the public, the public policies for the next decade, after the pandemic. So you have to read, if you have the occasion, my book, O Futuro Começa Agora, The Pandemia Utopia, because that book, I say the scenarios, the three scenarios, is published in Portugal in, by Edições 70 and in Brazil by Boitempo. And in this book, I'm trying to see three scenarios, the negationism, gatopardism, and alternative. Um, you can go into that. But then what I say is that this global constitutionalism, the Africans are the ones that know much better than any other country, how the global conditions thwart national constitutionalism, neutralize it, force them to change. Even in Europe, we have changed laws because of global constitutionalism of the European Union, very neoliberal in nature. So there is a global constitutionalism and a national constitutionalism. And uh, the national constitutionalism, probably more progressive, like the constitution of Brazil 1888, uh, is the weak part. So it yields. It has to uh, support all the violations that are coming from this global constitutionalism. Well, there are many other complicated stories here, but you can see, for instance, if you see the, the SDF in Brazil, uh, you can see how neoliberal it is also, even though I'm a very good friend of some of the judges there. That is to say, they want to defend civil and political rights, but not economic rights. They bypass the parliament even for privatization of Petrobras. All the privatization which is in Brazil is called privataria, as you know from the famous journalist that wrote that book on the privatization that is giving away the, the national assets, privatize them at any cost as they did and a very, very cheap price. So privataria, well, the, the Supreme Court doesn't say anything about that because they are in fact in favor of a neoliberal economy, but they won't have the democracy. That's why now they are turning against Bolsonaro in a way. So you see it's neoliberalism on the fringes of the compatibility of democracy with capitalism. That's how I theorize. Well, I think that um, the climate change, who, the, your question, right? Uh, no, who, who brought in the, the climate change question? I didn't, uh, 
Oh, yo, that's the second question by you. Well, uh, why is it going to be a failure? Because we have now a new Cold War. And this Cold War is between the United States and China. It's not a Cold War between democracy against uh, authoritarianism. Because democracy in the United States is becoming very authoritarian and many democracies are becoming very authoritarian. It is between two types of capitalism. Capitalism led by the multinational corporations with uh, a global capital, finance capital, the United States, and state capitalism by China. So they are two forms, two brands of capitalism. They are fight fiercely. And I think that they could lead, if you read foreign affairs, there are people here from international relations, they should be attentive to this. They think that this Cold War could become warm by 2030, when China is becoming the first economy of the world. Uh, and you see what's happening now. So that's why China is not even attending with the, 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 the thing, because they know that this climate change organization is really being dominated by green capitalism, the US version, to go against China. Uh, and China is not any better in the climate change policies. We know that. And they don't want to confront in that uh, scenario. They have other ways. They are organizing the Pacific and the Asian Pacific because that's where the power is now. For the first time after five centuries, the center of capitalism is not Europe, the United States, and Canada. Is Asia, is Asia, China, and all the other countries. They account for most of the people of the world in 2030. And we have to account for the fact that until 1830, China was the most important economy in the world. People forget that. For many centuries, it was the first economy of the world. It had to be crushed by two wars of opium to abandon that position. If you look at our kings from 16th, 17th, and 18th century, their garments, their porcelain, the place where they eat everything, the furniture, where did it come from? from China. Everything was coming from China. So China was the powerhouse. We have this uh, narrative, Western narrative, that uh, the center of Europe became in 16th century. Wow, well, forget it. Even uh, Latin America, as you know, was not discovered by, by the Europeans, by the Portuguese or the Spaniards, or discovered by the Chinese, but they didn't stay there. And good for them, in my view. Uh, and they were not on the Western side, but on the Eastern side in the Chile side. So that's precisely that. So you are in a period of fierce attack. Biden is doing nothing for climate change. European Union is much is doing much more at this point, but is really uh, what I call gato pardism. They to, to say change something to change nothing essential. So we are not going to change in Europe our models of consumption, our modes of production. We are going to have electric cars. But we are going to prioritize private cars all the time. And middle-class families may have two cars, three cars, and no public transportation. So they forget the fact that the electric cars have a battery, and this battery is lithium. And lithium is a mineral, rare mineral. And this is going to be found in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in China, in Congo, and a few other countries. And even in Europe, they are trying to dig it up here in Portugal very small quantities of lintu, because it's the mineral of the future, one of them. So extractivism, destruction of nature, you know, is the same, basically. So it's a shame. Uh, Sergio. Well, the academic, it depends on the academics. I mean, I'm a good friend, you know, that I've been together with him, he did many things. And uh, I can't go into that in detail, because you have to come to my classes in the second term, when I'm talking the post-colonialism, because there I'm dealing with epistemology of the, epistemology of the South. Uh, here I'm going to refer to that next week, but it will be just a brief as it uh, uh, respect to law. Because we are really trying to develop new forms to decolonize the university and bring about profound changes in knowledge at the universities through the epistemology of the South. And therefore, it's not uh, some change to take place in the universities. The academics have to be in the struggles because uh, uh, the, uh, the, the struggles are the key concept of, of, for the epistemology of the South. 
And they want to develop knowledge with, not knowledge about the type of knowledge that we do here. So that's why today, now even with the, 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 this pandemic, but by Zoom, but I spend 50% of my time with university and 50% of my time with social movements. I have to be in solidarity with them. I have been in Zoom hundreds of hours with feeling very isolated and indigenous people, the Cali students, the Cali youth in Cali in Colombia and things like that. We are working, we are discussing things and uh, how the university can be more responsible to them. Uh, I'm engaging in some projects of this kind. Um, you know, we are trying to change, but it will be academics isolated from the ivory tire. Now it's the end of it, it's the end of the university. The university in 30 years will be a capitalist enterprise like any other. You come here to get some skills in the diploma, not, not even knowledge, in much less critical knowledge. You come here to, to have a diploma and to be as ignorant as you were before, but with a diploma, so you get a job. For which, in fact, we don't need many qualifications because robotization is going to take away the need for that. So this is a little bit that it's not skeptical, my dear. It's skeptical if you remain in the academic life, but if you become very much involved in the social struggles that are going on in the world, well, then it's hopeful. It's my hope is there. So, but I, I, you know, we have to discuss that at a different time because it's a huge question. Well, Ricardo, yeah, that's, um, that's the problem now is uh, that's what I think is the aim in different ways of the rise of the extreme right uh, uh, and legal conservatism. As you know, as you see now in law schools, this positivism, harsh positivism that we thought that had been abandoned is the idea that you have to be literally confined within the limits of legal dogmatics and uh, to really just uh, defend the minimal versions of rule of law in order to avoid uh, a military coup, an authoritarian takeover because the extreme right is there, and if you are more advanced and so on. This uh, as a point, because we are in a period of defensive struggles, not offensive struggles. And therefore, in defensive struggles, we have now a political crisis in Portugal, which I think it, in, uh, is uh, based on the idea that the, the, the people, the, the parties involved, have not yet uh, been much aware that of the fact that we are, in fact, in a period of defensive uh, struggles. And that's a very dangerous, uh, uh, dangerous peer, uh, uh, period, because the, the entire system, uh, because the uh, polarization of wealth is going so vast. Countries are exploding. I think uh, Colombia is exploding. Chile is not exploding now because it has a constitution process. Others are cons Mexico may explode at any moment. Other countries may explode. Who is going to benefit from the explosion at this point? In the first phase, only the extreme right. Because we don't have extreme left anymore. You see? Because the, the left entered the political system. And we have the Zapatistas. We are still hoping to welcome the Zapatistas here in our school in November when they come to Portugal. We are negotiating with them. But Portugal is not very important for the Zapatistas. So I, I very much doubt that they ever come here. But they come, we are going to show the movie and we are going to, to have a debate with the commandantes that are coming with them. So that's the, that's the, the dilemma. But I think that... Uh, we have to be real, really, uh, you know, optimist of the will and the pessimist of the of knowledge of the thinking, as Gramsci said at this point. Uh, we have to really to continue to be hopeful, even though it is desperate very often. How can you do that? Well, me, my next class, I think I'll bring about a few ideas that I don't please don't get depressed. That's the point. Well. Uh, Edwin, no, I don't think that ecology is the bridge. Uh, I think ecology is, well, I use a lot, if you uh, read my, my work, particularly the, the end of Cognitive Empire, you can see in Portuguese, the fin do the Imperial Cognitive, which I already available in Spanish, you can see that I use the ecology in the sense that uh, the movement, the epistemological movement, which is also a legal movement, is, is from monocultures to ecologies. 
ecology in this sense are ecology of knowledge, for instance, it's not the ecology in the environmental sense. It's ecology in the sense of the cooperation among different systems, a peaceful cooperation to mutual enrichment of a given entity. That's what is an ecological thing, is in, in systems theory. It's not a, in the environmental theory. The environment, the ecology in this sense, does not bridge the gap because it reproduces it. There is the ecology of the, the rich and the ecology of the poor. In Glasgow, they don't even understand each other. It's the ecology of the rich. The ecology of the poor is not there because the ecology of the poor requires that we belong to nature. So we have to re re respect nature because nature is mother earth. So we have to end extractivism, period. They want to continue. They want to continue with lithium, as I said. So is the ecology of the rich people, not the poor. So they want to guarantee that capitalism is going to continue to be profitable. Green capitalism, but because it's good for capitalism, it's not good for us. Of course, Europe is going, the middle class, the protected middle class are going to benefit from that. But look at the rest of the world. I was uh, the other day with social movements in Mexico, in uh, East Moto, uh, uh, Tuantepec. <laughs> now, agora que traz o café, pô. Você esqueceu, só, man. Até que fica os que falam em português. Então, que, o Carlos perdeu qualidades. Como é? O que, co, co, coitado do seu Carlos, pá. Não, por amor de Deus, eu, oh, Carlos, desculpe todo. Vocês vão esse bar que este Carlos é uma maravilha. Está. Mas esquece de trazer o café, não é? De maneira que, se ele esquece, diga-lhe ele, se esquece a segunda vez, está reprovado. Já não é aprovado na carreira, de, na, no curso de Sociologia do Direito, está bem? Pronto. Vocês desculpem, eu tinha que desbundar em português, porque em inglês não faz sentido. Ok. So, I was... Uh, well, this guy, the coffee decomposed me. Uh, now, I, I think that, that... I think I was still with you, uh, Edwin. I, I don't see that. I think we have to, to really have a, a, a strong discussion of what we mean by ecology in environmental studies. And why do you distinguish in the environment? Because the environment, for instance, is a is a concept that never exists for the peasants or for the indigenous people. Because only the societies that violate the environment need the concept of environment. Because if you don't violate nature, why should you have environment? Environment is uh, the good conscience of a crime against uh, very often. We have to see this. So we are at a point in which uh, the critique is there. I'm not so concerned about the critique. We are very good at criticizing. The problem is the alternative. You see, that's the, you'll see the style of my next lecture. It will say, well, Caetano, about the revolutions. Well, the ones I, I know, and I know something about the English and the, and the, and the, 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 the American revolution. Well, it is, uh, may be considering anachronism, to try to analyze this revolution, particularly the English revolution, through these dichotomies, because the realities were different. I think that the French revolution, because of the Roi de l'Homme, because of the enlightenment and the Kantian idea, they brought the idea of the, the natural law, which was 17th century version, to a kind of a secular natural law that would become positive law. So they were the ones that brought the idea of this idea of law as a separate entity. And therefore we can say that whether they are revolutionary to bring about real law, and from then on, and the American, uh, the American revolution is in part also the same, so to say, even though that law is the systematic assassination of indigenous people, it's a crime. You know, you know and this is the question that we are, we are going to analyze the, the next week is that why are the contradiction between principles and practices so obvious and is not theorized because we go on continue to think that the principles are valid because they are universal, even though they are violated every day. The, the first three presidents of the United States were slave owners. So how can you defend the freedom of the people, liber liberty, and be a slave owner. No contradiction. Because the slaves were commodities, were not humans. 
So there was no contradiction there. So this is the modern democracy and modern domination. But I am advanced my Bruno. Uh, well, constitutions are a piece of paper. Nothing more, nothing less. This piece of paper can be very important when they come from social movements or from social forces, because most of the constitutions everywhere were a product of the elites. You know, the, even the Universal Declaration on Human Rights were eight people writing them, and they were became universal. But nobody in the world, except in Europe and the United States, participate in writing the declaration. So it's the same thing with the constitutions. Uh, the, the people here, yeah, I mean, professors here were writing the constitutions for Cape Verde Islands, for Mozambique, for, you know, Constitution is a piece of paper, it's a transplant, it's a legal transplant in many cases. But it's not only that, from a sociological point of view, there are constitutions that are more embedded in social realities. For instance, the, the Brazilian constitution and also the Direta Já movement, the popular amendments and so on. There was a, you know, a popular movement behind them. In Bolivia, you cannot understand the constitution of Bolivia without the indigenous movement and the Pacto de Unidad, because the Pacto de Unidad was the, the, the union of the different indigenous movement to bring about a constitutional proposal. And it was this constitutional proposal that Alberto Costa, which probably didn't answer your question because he was very much with this. Um, it was that proposal, the proposal that was going to be uh, translated in Ecuador to Monte Cristo. No? In Bolivia was a bit more complicated, the, the type of movements, because it was very strong, because in, the, in, in Bolivia is the only country in which indigenous people are majority people. They are 62% of the population. While in Ecuador, it changes, some people say 25, other people say 14, nobody knows, actually. So the problem is what are the, the forces behind this? Well, in my courses on sociology of law this year, I'm not going to, to teach much of this, but uh, I'm working a lot on these questions of constitutionalism and what the problem with the constitutions when they are progressive is that the first day after the promulgation, they start to be undone. They start to be destroyed by the elite forces. That's what I'm telling now to the constitutional assembly members in Chile. I say, pay attention to what's happening in the other countries. After the constitution is promulgated, we are very happy. The constitution is here, we won. No, you didn't win. You win if you are going to keep the movement alive to keep the constitution alive. Because if you go home, the constitution will be undone. So one chapter on this, in this book is called Deconstitutionalization. How do societies undo the constitution when they are progressive, particularly by the elites. They don't win the assembly and Chile is going to be a good case because the, the elites are in a minority, in the, a very strict minority in the constitutional assembly. I doubt that they are going to be quiet after the constitution. They are going to undo it. So that's the problem. So there were, but there were more questions. Well, I think we have to, to end this uh, almost three hour lecture, but uh, there were two more questions and I don't want to frustrate you. Two? What? Three from here and two from here. Oh my God. So we have to, to go, go ahead. So two questions from here, people that didn't ask yet. The second one is from Priscilla. Priscilla is over there. Thank you. I'm Steve. Ah, Thank you for the lecture. What is your name, please? I'm Steve. I'm Steve? Steve. Steve. Like Stephen. Como Steve Jobs. Como? <laughs> like Steve Jobs, yeah. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. So what is your name? I'm Steve. 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 Yes. Oh my God, it's so simple. So simple. 
it was a future oriented question professor that i had for you uh, so uh, legal reformism is a movement that works with the institutions with the rule of the game and try to go to the limit and and try to get uh, the much that we gain from uh, the institutions in place and uh, looking at the future i wonder whether you have hope uh, maybe uh, maybe desperate but possibly hopeful about the use of institution for uh, social change uh, there are maybe the crisis of social democracy is uh, starts to be ending now but on the other end there are also uh, developments outside institutional systems for instance, uh, Greta Thunberg, it was certainly not a product of institutions or in the um, internet area more generally. And I wonder whether you see uh, social progress in the future inside or outside uh, the institutional system. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, with this noise out there, uh, the last part of your question. So I, I knew that we're discussing legal reformism is going through the institutions. And then your question is? whether you think in the future it's going to happen inside the institutional system or outside oh yeah oh, that's a good question well priscilla now i it was for him okay good three questions from the the people on live stream mr aramask please over here more difficult names than Steve here. Uh, first one is from Anna Piekarska from Poland. Um, she, she says, uh, I'd like to ask for a further elaboration on the rule of law. I didn't quite catch the difference between imposition and the other mentioned one. Bench twist is for you. Between imposition? Yeah. Uh, I didn't quite catch the difference between imposition and the other one you mentioned. Imposition. Imposition. Okay. Further elaboration oh, yeah. on the rule of law. I know. I know. The it's neoliberal imposition okay. or something. Uh, yeah. um, the second one uh, is from Songkrant Pongbonjung. I'm sure I'm saying this very wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, it's from Canada and it's about popular lawyering. And he asks, what did popular lawyering contribute to wider impact? Professor Santos found in this field work in the past that can still apply today. Um, and finally, uh, from Ukraine, Maria Sokolova, do I correctly understood that conservatory uh, the conservatory of judges can be counter-revolutionary in one period and revolutionary in either period? Okay, very good questions. Well, I salute the people that are in live stream because it's not very, usual to have uh, questions from different countries in our lecture. So, um, good. Well, Steve, uh, that's, uh, that's a good question. And uh, please come to the next lecture because I, I think I'm going to deal with that. Um, because the tension between the outside institutions and uh, inside institutions has always been there, even in the, legal reformism. It is true that the legal reformism has to operate through the institutions, but what gets into the agenda usually was developed outside, outside the, the, the institutions by popular protests, by strikes and things like that. For instance, in this book, I compare two movements, two gay movements in Chicago. One that wanted just to follow the, the institutional changes, that is to say, they relied only on lawyers, not on, on protests. They didn't organize the collab. They were both very, two powerful movements, gay movements in the 70s, 80s in Chicago, and one following the, the institutional avenue and the other more uh, protest. Uh, and uh, and uh, so trying to evaluate which was uh, more sex, uh, uh, successful in their struggles. And the studies at the time show, and I haven't yet read another article just came to, to me, sent by someone precisely on a, another issue of two movements following two strategies, one more social protest oriented and another more institutional uh, uh, oriented. So you really sometimes enter, as I say in the, in the kind of law, emancipatory can 
enter in conflicts because sometimes lawyers, for instance, I witnessed that in my research, lawyers tell the movement, please don't do any protest now. Because if you do protest when our case is being tried in court, the judges are going to react negatively. So the lawyers command protests. Some movements don't allow that. I mean, they say, well, you lawyers do your job in courts, but we are going to continue our social protests, our activities. So there has been a tension in movements where these outside and inside. The question now is, is the institutions are closing in on popular aspirations of people and not allowing them to get in, how do, how do we do? That's the topic of next lecture. <laughs> well, um, Anna, I think from, uh, from Poland. Well, Anna, the, the problem is that the, the um, yeah, it is, uh, the, your question is, is a good question because uh, we can say that the imposition can polarize too much uh, between endogenous movement, the struggle inside the country of political forces or economic social movements, etc., or imposition from outside, from uh, uh, forces, international forces, maybe states. If you are uh, in this region, will be the United States or European Union. If you are in China, in Asia, probably China is imposing the same. So they use their economic power, their clout, you know, to, to create all kinds of impositions. Most of the impositions are usually exceptional type of measures. For instance, the embargoes. Uh, for instance, uh, Trump and Biden, they continue embargoing Venezuela, embargo. Cuba could have developed vaccines, but they are embargoing them. They cannot really uh, obtain in the international market the products for the vaccines. They could be distributing them freely throughout Latin America, at least. And where it was the plan. They have such a medical knowledge, but they put embargo because they are favoring the five multinational corporations in pharmaceutical. I, it's published by me. You know, the, the ones that have the 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 the, the exchange uh, higher exchange uh, presence in the in the in the stock exchange today that's uh, Lyle Healy that's Pfizer there are Novartis and uh, another one there are four or five that own these companies that are producing the vaccines and they need the patents so uh, and they don't give away the patents so they impose they impose on the European Union don't allow a suspension of the patents because we could have the world vaccinated very, very rapidly. Because a vaccine that costs 20 euros could cost three euros. That's the difference of the patents. But they, they know that the vaccine is what we call now the new liquid gold. You know, oil was the gold black uh, gold uh, in the 20th century. The liquid gold, because you know, people in the wealthy countries, and there are millions of people, they are having three vaccines per year. Can you imagine how much money these companies are making? It's, it's, it's astronomical. And that's why in Africa, only 10% of the people have vaccines. And the problem is that if, if the, the Africa doesn't have, then no, the world is not secure. So the imposition is what I'm telling about is, is this, this imposition. For instance, was imposition in Russia in, at the end of the collapse, of, and you are in Poland, so you are very much aware of this. It was not real imposition in this case because the system collapsed and the United States came in to offer uh, legal aid, basically. In fact, it was my school in medicine that provide most of knowledge to bring in an investment that you can't imagine how many millions of dollars were invested in Russia without success, quite frankly. <laughs> you, they were not successful because they wanted to reproduce the kind of liberal legal system and uh, until up until now, at least uh, we don't see that. And uh, you don't see either any legal reformism in Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, Russia. And in Poland, you know, now we have this debate between Poland and the, the, the European Union about courts, precisely about the, the independence of courts. So there is a problem here. 
So is the, the European Union imposing on Poland? Yes. Is this imposition different from the neoliberal imposition on the less developed countries? Probably different. If you take the political orientation, that is to say the neoliberal imposition is forcing you to give away, to neutralize social rights and more just society. Is the European Union trying to impose in Poland a less just society by struggling for independence to the share in Poland? I'm not going to answer this now. It's your question. Is it uh, something that we welcome because it's an imposition, but it's an imposition that is welcomed by people in Poland or on, on the contrary, is an imposition violently imposed. And many of the neoliberal impositions of the neoliberalism were very violent, I, particularly in Africa. For instance, look at this. The World Bank arrives in 1998 in Africa and tells the Africans, don't invest in universities because you don't have money for the universities. Universities are not profitable for you. You have to invest only in uh, uh, secondary schools, in primary schools. University, you buy the university services from the West. We had fabulous universities in Africa. Dar es Salaam, Makerere, Nairobi. They were fabulous universities. Many people in the seventh from Europe and the United States were teaching there. They were really very good universities. All of a sudden, they are defunded and uh, the scholars there are put at the service of consultancy firms to produce information for the international reports. And the universities are gone in a very deep crisis still today. So this was an imposition. It's the same type of imposition that the European Union is putting there. This is not a legal issue, it's a political issue. So I have my politics. I think the European Union is right in this. You may think that the European Union is wrong. I respect you because we are in democracy, but it's politics, it's not legal. The second question from live stream from a uh, uh, song from Canada. Well, I think popular lawyering is going on. Uh, it's, uh, it's going on in Latin America, quite frankly. Uh, it's going there. Uh, many people uh, uh, are still risking their lives. The problem is that popular lawyers were relatively safe in some countries. I know of some young popular lawyers in Brazil now, in the Northeast Brazil, they have to have to change the address every week because they receive threats from the landowners, from Grilage now, because they are invading the indigenous land. And some of these lawyers are still involved in uh, the defense of the indigenous people or peasants or whatever. And they are threatened. And since they are threatened and some of them have been assassinated, they change the address and they move to other states and so on. So it's a very risky business because societies are becoming more polarized with the extreme right. And the extreme right kills. <laughs> they really don't go by democratic arguments. Uh, the Colombians have a very good story on this, a very good, uh, very tragic tradition and the Mexicans, not very different one. So we know this, so they are still there. What is gone in the United States is, well, radical lawyers are gone uh, long ago, and um, public, interest, uh, public interest law is still there. People that were, for instance, uh, uh, lawyering in favor of consumers, like the famous Ralph Nader, they are still there, but very, very weak now, because there are no funds, because the states, because these public law offices are funded by the state. The popular lawyers in Latin America used to be by the state, but basically by the movements themselves. But if the movements become less and less powerful, they don't have money to pay the lawyers because these popular lawyers, they have to be paid. Not uh, high fees, of course. They, it's a normal salary of someone, of a worker, actually. But they have to do that. Some, they have, some of them, they do regular lawyering to make some money and then to do pro bono. 
for the social movements. There is another alternative. They are still there, but they are there in very, very difficult situations, right? Well, from our Ukrainian friend, um, conservative judges are reactionary, not necessarily. Uh, they are not uh, contra-revolutionary, not necessarily. Because, you know, we have to distinguish between conservative and reactionary. What is the distinction, uh, friend? Is uh, because I, I call you friend because I didn't get your name. Um, conservatives come from a tradition of politics, uh, of democratic politics, from the French Revolution. The French Revolution promote three values, liberty or freedom, equality and fraternity. Well, immediately then, we see that very rapidly after the first year of the revolution, we threw the division between the conservatives and the progressives, later on socialists. What is the difference? The difference is that the conservatives prioritize liberty, liberty above all. And then equality and fraternity, to the extent they do not impinge upon liberty. But they, they believe in the formal equality, but they think that liberty is above equality. Why the socialists or progressives, as they are called, or leftists, as they are called, they think that equality, they prioritize equality over liberty. Or at least they say, there is no equality without freedom and no freedom without equality. And this tension is going to reproduce itself in all the human rights literature. You see the human rights more hegemonic and counter hegemonic. We have a tradition, you have that in my books on a Marxist tradition of human rights, a liberal tradition of human rights, is that. But the conservatives, they accept the values, but prioritize differently. The reactionary are against the principles in principle. A reactionary is someone that not, does not believe in equality before the law, for instance. They believe that you know, black people, Africans and African diaspora, Afro-descendants are inferior. Indigenous are inferior, women are inferior. Gays are inferior to, to heterosexual. They degrade ontologically people. The extreme right today is really promoting, is going backwards before the French, the, the French Revolution, so to say, at least in my understanding. So they, I, I distinguish the reactionary from the conservative. The conservative may play the game of democ liberal democracy. The reactionary undermines the, the game, like Hitler like Bolsonaro, like many others in different types. That is to say, they arrive to power by democracy, but they never rule by democracy and they never abandon power by democracy. Look at Trump. He promoted the invasion of the Congress. I mean, it's more than documented. The guy was behind this document. At least he didn't prevent it. Can you imagine? 6th of January, the guys entering in the Congress doing what they did. You know, so the extreme right is not comfortable even with liberal democracy. So that the distinction. So when I talk about the conservative judges, I think that they be counter reformist. It's not to say that they are necessarily reactionary, but they are counter the idea of social and economic rights because it's only social economic rights that in this model of legal reformism, the social classes, popular class, vulnerable classes can have some Welfare, limited welfare. But that, that's the way in which we have been creating the middle classes in Europe. And um, sometimes they exist also outside the world. They all exist now in China. So you don't change the system, but you regulate the system. So the counter reformism is that you don't allow that. So you are the neoliberal, but it's not necessarily reactionary. It's reactionary if you really not even the rules of the game you obey. You obey the rules of the game to reach power. Once you are there, you abandon the rules of the game. You, you see that every day today when everything that Bolsonaro says is rule of the game, democratic, no. Is a open violation of the rule of the game. So this is, uh, I wrote a piece some time ago called Democracy 
democracies may die democratically. And uh, it is available in Portuguese in English. And is a chronicle. And if you go to the web, you can see that text. What I'm saying is that liberal democracies are not defending themselves very well from the anti-democrats. So if they keep electing Trumps, Ivan Dukes, uh, Hitlers, Bolsonaro, you know, they have difference. I'm not saying they are the same. Of course they are not. But they are people that undermine the rules of the game when they reach power. They produce coups like uh, Hitler or produce something else. If democracies are going to go on electing these people, one day we look around and they thought that we're in democracies, you are already in a monstrous regime combining dictatorship with democracy. And you never know where is the component of democracy and where is the component of dictatorship. We continue next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend.